Well, friends, we are just delighted to be able to present to you a very, very important topic. In fact, it took a little bit of time to choose this title, but it is so apropos for everything we'll be talking about today. The Startling Truth about angels and demons. There is a truth about angels and demons. In fact, I've been asked so many questions about angels lately. People coming up to me and saying, do you believe in angels? And uh, do they exist? Will they always exist? What do they do? Only some of the questions we hope to answer for you today. Many, many more out there that we are going to be referring to. But I want to say that Jack has spent so much time so much effort, so much research in getting this together. Thank you, Jack. I really have, Rixella. I've gone through 50 different commentaries, Hebrew and Greek lexicons, to know the original languages for some of the verses I'm going to use today, the books of authors about this subject, and we're going to do some shocking things in this particular video things you may have never heard about the angels, things that may shock you about the most hideous, heinous sin ever committed by angels and why they are bound in Tartarus and bound in the great river Euphrates for the war of wars, Armageddon in the future. It's going to be interesting. Very, very revealing. I learned so much from Jack Van Ippy as we were studying for this video for you. Angels are universal, it seems, in the major religions of the world. First of all, Christians have a real faith in angels. We believe they exist. We believe they have a purpose. We believe they're active today. The Islamic faith also believes in angels. They believe that there are two angels assigned to each person. The one on the right hand keeps track of their good works. The one on the left hand keeps track of the bad deeds. And then, of course, Judaism teaches that there are angels. The Bible reveals this in the Old Testament and New Testament. They talk about Michael who fights the and avenges God's wars. And then we talk about Gabriel who reveals the secrets that God wants man to know, like Gabriel came to Mary. So in the major religions, angels are very, very prevalent. Today, we want to reveal what God wants us to know about angels, fallen and good angels. Uh, Jack, what does the Bible say about angels? And give us some facts about angels, if you will, Jack. Well, first of all, there are 283 verses in the Old and New Testaments about angels. And there are 31 different titles for the leader of the fallen angels called Lucifer. Along with that title, he has 30 other names in this book. So that's a total of 314 different references. And we're going to be dealing with many of them today. Now, if we dealt with everything, we'd have to do what we did in Revelation Reveal and have 10 hours of videos, which we can't do. So we're going to hit the highlights today. And everything we say will be from this book. I hear some of these people, they talk about having a vision or they've been in heaven. They come back and everything they say is completely contradictory to God's holy word. I won't do that. It's God's word and God's word only. Why? Because 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Why? Why? Because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. Now, this is interesting, folks, because when Paul wrote those two verses inspired by the Holy Spirit, he was talking about the Old Testament saints because there wasn't a word of the New Testament written as yet. But he said, all the Old Testament is inspired. Holy men, the prophets, spoke as the Spirit directed them. Now, for the New Testament... When Jesus was leaving, he said in John 16, verses 12 and 13, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the New Testament is the guidance of the Holy Spirit for our day and age. And I'll tell you something. John 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth. Don't listen to anything else or anybody else. 
And 1 Peter 1.25 says that the word of the Lord endures forever and forever. So let's taste the good word of God and the powers of the world to come concerning angels. Hebrews 6 verse 5. Oh, Jack, I, I love the Bible, don't you? When the men wrote the Bible, they didn't just write what they thought. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God told them what to write. That's God speaking. When you open the Bible, that's God speaking. How wonderful to know that we have the almighty word of God. Now, I've written down some questions that are probably going through your mind right now about angels. The first one, I'm going to put Jack on the spot. Who created the angels? Did they always exist? No. Who created the angels, Jack? We're going to see today that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are eternal beings. Not one of the three had a beginning, nor will they ever have an ending. And as they planned things in heaven before this old world was formed, they laid down a few points of interest. They chose Jesus to be the one who would create the angels. What? Yeah. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, verse 14, so that's Christ. Let's put that term in place of word then. In the beginning was Christ, and Christ was with God, and Christ was God. Verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And I like Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. For by Christ were all things created that are in heaven, angels, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by Christ and for Christ. And by him all things consist, even the very movements of the planets are in the hands of the Lord Jesus. Now the terms there, the principalities and powers, have to do with angels, as we're going to see further in the study. All right, then. If the Lord Jesus created the angels, uh, that was his function to do the creation part, then uh, I want to ask Jack this question. That wasn't Jesus beginning at Bethlehem at all. Some people think that Jesus started as a baby in Bethlehem. No, he was from eternity, right, Jack? Yeah. All three members of the Trinity are eternal beings. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But the term there is not Yahweh, the name of the Father, but Elohim, and Elohim always means more than one. So there's a Trinity there doing the creating. Of course, we see the Father creating. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth as one of the members of the Trinity. But then we see Christ doing it, as I've already mentioned. In fact, one of the days, we're going to receive one of five crowns to lay at the feet of Jesus, and hopefully even more crowns. And as we do, we're going to say, Thou art worthy, Jesus, to receive glory, honor, and praise, for Thou hast created all things. Revelation 4, verse 11. And of course, the Holy Spirit was there because in verse 2, the second verse of the whole Bible, the Spirit of God is moving upon the face of the water. So there is a trinity. Now, it's easy to quote New Testament verses. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a trinity. Second Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, a trinity. First John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So there they were, eternal beings, never having a beginning, never having an ending, as we're going to see. Oh, I love it. I love it, don't you? Let me just say that right up front, we want you to know something that we do not believe in Darwin's origin of the species. Now, he wrote this book, and he published it in 1859. We do not believe that man evolved. We don't believe in the evolutionary theory. Uh, take a look at this. 
The Evolution of Darwin. Now, that's quite an interesting article right there. And then how about this one? Meet the New Boss. Uh, of course, that's quite a good picture of Charles Darwin there. And Mystery of How Life on Earth Began, solved by British scientists. Now, they're talking about how the Earth evolved and molecules and all the rest, and they think that they can go back four billion years. Well, we can go back even farther than that because God created the heavens and the earth billions and billions and billions of years ago. But we do not believe that man evolved, the evolutionary theory of man. Correct, Jack? You don't believe that, do you? Absolutely not. It's a bunch of monkey business. And, you know, you're going to be seeing this picture right now about these monkeys. And I did it for a purpose because, you know, Darwin says that was our beginnings. But I have a book here. The Word of God in Genesis 126 has the Father saying, Let us, a trinity, make man in our image. You think your God looks like a monkey, that your Savior Jesus looks like one of those apes? Of course not. And we reject this nonsense, and it's sad when hundreds of preachers recently in America signed a petition that they believed in evolution. You ought to get out of the ministry, you bunch of hypocrites. Get out of the ministry, you bunch of hypocrites. And I mean that with all my heart. Now, the point I'm going to make today is I believe in the gap theory. That there is a gap between Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, and it could go back billions of years, the geological ages. And I'm going to show you today that this thing is not recent. It goes all the way back to the church fathers. It goes back to the King James original version, 1611, 400 years ago before Darwin lived, before the geological ages were propounded by astronomers. So we are not trying to teach these things just to please them. We're teaching them because it's the Word of God and history from the ages past. Well, we're going to really be talking about that gap theory. I grew up believing that, and we'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But uh, since God always existed, He always existed, the universe could have most likely have been created billions and billions of years ago. How do you like this headline? How old is the universe? How old is the universe? Now we know, according to the Hubble telescope, they think they have discovered how old the universe is. Some scientists say that after eight years of studying the stars, they know how old the universe is. NASA appears back to the beginning of the universe. Space probes finding put age at 13.7 billion years old. Age of the universe confirmed the Hubble telescope has sighted the oldest stars in our galaxy, giving a new measure for the age of the universe as a whole. It puts the Milky Way at between 13 and 14 billion years old. Study traces of animal life back one billion years. They believe that animal life could go back that far. And telescopes expand view of the universe. Now, numerous theologians made the gap theory very, very popular. Very popular. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the original creation, then a gap between verse 1, Genesis 1-1, one, one, and Genesis ver uh, verse 2. Jack, who were those theologians that made it so popular? Well, we're talking the fact that this earth could possibly be 13 billion years old because God is eternal. He's existed for hundreds of billions of years and will always be there. I read an article by the astronomers the other day. They said this world will not end for at least 100 trillion more years. That's pretty good news, isn't it? And I believe that because God is eternal and His creation is eternal. But there could have been judgments along the way. And we're going to get into why we believe uh, these reports Jess Rexell read in a minute. I have here a copy of uh, the Schofield Bible. And the first version was written in 1909, revised in 1917, and then finally revised in 1967. And there were 16 of the greatest scholars ever in our day and age who backed this teaching proposed by Schofield about a billion year or billions of years gap between Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2. First of all, I go back to 19... Nine and 1917. 
Here are the men. William Erdman, Arnold Gabeline, James Gray, Elmore Harris, W.G. Moorhead, Arthur T. Pearson, William L. Pettengill, and Henry Weston. In 1967, Frank E. Gabeline, William Culbertson, Charles Feinberg, Alan McRae, Clarence Mason, Elva McLean, Wilbur M. Smith, and John F. Walvard, 16. You can trust these men. But let's go back further. Do you know that even in the original King James Version 1611, these were 40-some translators, mainly Puritans, who left two textual points referring to a gap that could have made it possible for the earth to be billions of years old. And then, of course, in 1997, the Nelson Study Bible was printed and 47 of today's great scholars, just like the ones from the days of Schofield, backed the gap theory. And recently, I have these friends, know many of them personally, who backed it. I read their books. We first of all had Dr. Barnhouse, Dr. M. R. DeHaan, Dr. Hoddle, Dr. Ironside, Dr. Larkin, Dr. Savage, your pastor, also Dr. Regan, a great theologian today, and Dr. Merle Unger. I mean, I've got 74 different scholars backing what I'm teaching, so you can pretty well believe what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. All, all right, Dr. H.H. H. Savage, I just loved him. He was my pastor, and he explained the gap theory so well. I'll never forget sitting there just thinking, woo, I can't believe billions of years old. First time I heard him talk about that. Dr. Clarence Larkin did a beautiful job of expressing the fact that the creation of the universe and our world goes back much farther than 6,000 years to Adam. It goes back much, much farther. He wrote what you're going to see right now in 1918. The title of this article was in the book, The Creation of the Original Earth. And this he goes on to say, was in the dateless past. It was no doubt a most beautiful earth covered with vegetation and inhabited with fish and fowl and animal life and probably with human life. How long it continued in this condition, we are not told. But uh, an awful catastrophe befell it. It became formless and void and submerged in water and darkness, Genesis 1-2. It was not originally so, we know, from Isaiah 45, 18. When God originally created the earth, it wasn't emerged in water. The Bible tells us that. And uh, so Jack's going to explain to us thoroughly, what is this gap theory? And uh, how does it really uh, not contradict the Bible at all? In fact, the Bible backs it up, all right? Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, in verse 1, God created the world that was perfect. But in verse 2, something happened. It says, the earth became and this is the Hebrew expression now, tohu wabohu, meaning without form and void, meaningless, empty. God doesn't create anything like that. And so Clarence Larkin said, Isaiah 45, 18, Thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens, yea, God who formed the earth and made it. It goes on to say that he established it and he created it not tohu vobohu. He didn't create it without form and void. It was a perfect earth. That's what God does. But it became that because of the sin of a certain angelic being named Lucifer who became a violent sinner and was cast out of the third heaven and he was cast into the place called the earth of that time probably millions and billions of years ago. 
Well, I'm very, very interested in what he just had to say. The earth was created beautifully, just like Dr. Clarence Larkin wrote in that beautiful article. It was wonderful. Habitation. We cannot even imagine uh, what it was like. And then something happened. Jack mentioned a judgment. Now, who in the world caused the judgment, Jack? Can you give me some light on that, please? This creature called Lucifer, and he goes by 31 names in the Word of God. But that's his original name, when he was in heaven with God. And Rexella, I like what Dr. Ironside said. This cannot apply to any human being, because this particular personage has superhuman powers. It has to be a superhuman being. And that's what the prince of the power of the air the one that's called the old dragon serpent, his name is Satan as well as Lucifer, was when he was cast out of heaven. Now the story of his fall is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 14 and onward. It says, Thou hast been in the garden of Eden, Lucifer. And of course, that was not when Adam and Eve were there. This is prehistorically centuries before, millions of years in the past. And then he goes on to say in the next verse, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That was the covering for the holiness of God, and he served in the third heaven. But he said, something went wrong. Thou was created perfect, but thou hast sinned. Now what was that sin? pride for the text goes on to say he fell because of his beauty in first timothy 3 verse 6 it says that a pastor an evangelist should not be a novice a new convert because being lifted up by pride as a new christian serving in that capacity he'll fall into the condemnation of the devil or into the same condemnation into which satan fell pride. So that was part of his sin. Now, the casting out is recorded in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. God's throne in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. He wasn't satisfied to serve Yahweh. He said, I'm going to rise above him. I'm going to take over heaven. And Jesus was there from all eternities, I've already said. And he said in Luke 10, 18, I beheld Satan as a lightning fall from heaven. Where did he fall to? This pre Adamic earth. You see, what is recorded concerning Adam and Eve in six days is the restoration theory. The world had been here for billions of years and now it's being restored in the six days. And we'll prove that along the way. So here is Satan. He has fallen. And we're going to show you this is why the judgment came. And I'm going to show you where it came. You know, some people think that uh, Lucifer, Satan, was always an old, mean, mean, horrible, horrible creation, but he wasn't. Jack just explained that he was one of the angels that was closest to God. And then one day, I'll tell you, he wanted to become God. He wanted to become over God. And so God said, no, this is not why I created you. Remember? God created the angels. This is not why I created you, Lucifer. And so he had to expel Lucifer from heaven. Jack explained he expelled him to, uh, out of the third heaven and into the universe and down to earth. That's not the earth that we know right now, but that's the earth that was preexistent before Adam. So here's Lucifer. And I can't get over it. One third of the angels followed him. One third of the Revelation twelve four. Yes, Jack yep. explained he expelled him to uh, out of the third heaven and into the universe and down to earth. 
that's not the earth that we know right now, but that's the earth that was preexistent before Adam. So here's Lucifer. And I can't get over it. One third of the angels followed him. One third of the Revelation twelve four. Yes, Jack. Yeah. One third of the angels followed Lucifer. He must have been pretty powerful up there if he could persuade one third of them to follow him. What a powerful, powerful personality he must have had to convince them that he could be God. And so they followed him down to earth. Okay, Jack, my question is this. What proof do we have that there was another civilization before Adam and that there were people right here on earth, planet earth, Jack? After Lucifer said, I will be like the most high God, the next verse, God continues, They that see thee, Lucifer, shall narrowly look upon thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities? Now, that's pretty plain language. That's not for today. They didn't have that when Adam and Eve were here. There were no nations, no kings, no cities. This was... Another world, billions of years ago. And furthermore, when Adam was finally created in the six-day restoration period, God said to him in Genesis 1.28, Go forth and replenish the earth. Boy, that's meaningless language. If you're the first man and woman in existence, how can you replenish something if there's not been something before it? Now, that's exactly what he said to Noah when they came out of the ark in Genesis 9-1. Go and replenish the earth. Now, that was easy for those eight people to do because they could have sexual experiences with their loved ones and create children galore as they have. And that's why six billion, seven hundred million of us are here today. But that's fine for Noah and his posterity. But for us, it's a problem. As we think about Adam and Eve, God says, go forth and replenish the earth. That can only be meaningful if there were kingdoms, if there were nations, if there were cities in the past. And remember, he also said to Lucifer, you have made the world a wilderness. And that's that language again from the Hebrew, tohu wabohu, without form and void. God did not create it that way. Read again Isaiah 45, 18, and he ended that text with that God created that earth to be inhabited. It's so plain, folks, that there was another civilization. And in a few minutes, we're going to get into the restoration experience, and that is called restoration theology because it's the reviving of the earth that was destroyed through Satan's fall and in six days, renovated and renewed. All right. So here we have Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the universe, and the earth. And then after verse 1, that terrible, terrible gap where Satan was expelled from heaven and took one-third of the angels with him who became the demons. And they took over, terrible judgment. And then there's a restoration. Now, Jack, explain the difference in that restoration and creation. It wasn't created again. It was restored again, yeah. correct? Go forth, Adam, and even replenish the earth. You're now the new inhabitants of this earth. And in these six days, uh, everything's going to come to pass that we had in the old world before it became tohu wabohu, without form and void. I am going to read for you something here with so much going on in our world. I had people coming to me all the time. They say, why did God do that? Why did God have that happen? And I say, God didn't do that. Lucifer did that. Satan did that. He, at the moment, is the god of this world system. And so we're, I'm going to read something that Jack wrote some time ago, and it's so relevant to what is happening in the world today. Satan's hell-bound cohorts plant thoughts of stealing, vow-breaking, swearing, coveting, revenge, deceit, seduction, jealousy, slander, gossip, greed, hoarding, anger, discouragement, drinking, 
drugs, fornication, adultery, orgies, and even sickness in the mind. The flesh reacts through the mind gate or mental processes and bang! The individual caught unprepared or unawares responds by committing the demonic inspired act. However, if one resists the devil and his workers of iniquity through a mind given over to pure thinking, victory begins immediately. And all those things that Jack enumerated, they don't come from God. They come from the God of this world. He's not my God. And I know my God, my Lord Jesus Christ. And you can have victory. Murder and all the rest. Jack, that was the most interesting article. Thank you. Well, I wish we could take every one of those sins and show you where it happened somewhere in the Scripture. But let's just uh, use one text right now. John 8, 44. Jesus said to the crowd around him, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. And there bode no truth in him, for he is a liar and the father of liars. Now, there are two sins mentioned that this sinister being creates in people. How could he have murdered anyone in the beginning? Cain murdered his brother Abel, and it was a satanically inspired act. And all our lies and all our sins come because we let this one have control and boy he wants to get control because first peter 5 8 says that the devil is a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour and i'll tell you unless you live in the word of god and on your knees it's going to be pretty rough to overcome it all and that's why james 4 verse 7 says resist the devil and he'll flee from you say no too many people blame their sins on other people and even all these murder trials. Oh, temporary insanity, baloney. The father of murder, Satan, put it in the hearts of all these people. Forget the psychiatry and all the rest. Just believe what the Bible has to say. And Rexella, it's the mind, as I said in the article, and we have to cleanse that mind. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed over all of the various sins. How? By the renewing of your mind. You keep that mind in God's holy word, and you're going to have victory. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Any sin. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11. 11. Well, once again, Jack, I thank you for all of the Bible. Oh, what would we do without it? That's the sure word of God. But I have a question. Lucifer was cast out of only the third heaven. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven is where God lives and where God has those two-thirds of the angels that didn't follow him and where our parents go, their souls go when they pass on. Their bodies are in the ground, but their souls are in the third heaven with Jesus. How wonderful. All right, Lucifer, where is he right now? Is he here on earth? How about it, Jack? Is he here on earth? Well, talking about the prehistoric era, the pre-Adamite time, he was actually ruling on the earth, and that's why Ezekiel 28, 13 stated that he was in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. And that's why he could destroy kingdoms and cities and all the rest. Things have changed since the Restoration period. The six days of the world as we now know it, the reviving of everything that originally was, and the Bible mentions that there are three heavens. The atmosphere, the trophosphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the ionosphere, and the econosphere. And the first heaven goes up to 600 miles. From 601 onward, it's the second heaven, and astronomers tell us we've arrived 90% at the end of the second heaven right now, which is 187 trillion billions of miles, unlimited. 
And then above that is the third heaven where God rules, and that's where originally he was cast out. Right now, Satan is in control of heavens one and two. He can visit the earth and walk about as a roaring lion, but he's in control of everything up to 187 trillion billions of miles and even 10% above that. But he cannot control the third heaven out of which he was cast. And right now, the Bible says he's the God of this world system, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. And that's why we have such a rough time as Christians because we're not fighting other human beings. And the Bible gives the description of wrestlers. In Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, other people, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirit, demonic wickedness in high places. And oh, what a battle it is. And so we need to be in the Word and in prayer and having a purity and cleansing of mind to be able to overcome Him. Uh, there's something that I'd like to just draw to your attention, sort of a little uh, side headline, if you will, please. And it has to do with how Satan wants to be God. That's why he was expelled from heaven. He wanted to overcome the Trinity. He wanted to be God. Well, he still wants to be God. And can you imagine? Take a look at this picture. Satan on three different occasions attempted to tempt uh, Jesus Christ and make Christ subservient to him. In other words, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you the world. Can you imagine that he was saying that to the one who created him? He said that to Jesus Christ, the one who had created him. Fall down and worship me and I'll give you this world. Well, you know, Jesus Christ knew who God was. He was God. And so he didn't do it, praise the Lord. He, he couldn't do it because he was God. But Satan still wants to be God. And uh, there is going to be a time when he will, certainly through the things that are going on the earth, when he will become a kind of God, if you will. Right, Jack? Like the new world order, yeah. right? Right. In the beginning, he said, I'm going to become God. I'm going to take over. And that's Isaiah 14, verse 13 didn't work now he's on earth and he tempts jesus for 40 days and it's recorded in matthew chapter 4 verses 5 to 9 and that final temptation is look around look at this world all these things will i give you if you'll fall down and worship me i wonder why he thought he had that kind of power and jesus says get him say get behind me you devil it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him, and him only shall you serve. And he failed a second time. Now, I recently made a video entitled, The New World Order Rising. This will be Satan's final attempt to control the world. And guess what? It's going to work. The Antichrist shall come, 1 John 2.18. Cardinal Biffy of the Catholic Church says, I believe he's alive and waiting in the wings. Now, one of the things that he does after becoming a dictatorial socialist for the European Union is going to be the leader in this thing. And Ironside years ago said, the final world government will be a socialistic one. And that's the first step towards communism. And this one who is the leader of the New World Order gets to a point where, because everyone's so admiring him, that he thinks he's God. And he magnifies himself above every God, Daniel 11, 36. He exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped, Second Thessalonians 2, 4. And the public falls for him because in Matthew 24, Verse 24, it says that this one, if it were possible, shall deceive the very elect, the best of believers who are here. We've been evacuated. We've been raptured uh, through the come up here of Revelation 4.1. But the great revival takes place in Revelation 7, verses 9 to 14. And a multitude, like the sand of the sea, innumerable hosts come out of the great tribulation to wash their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 14. 
And that crowd could easily be deceived. For it says, all who dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. But I think even some of those will fall by the wayside and accept this one. So this leads to the final sign, the coming of the new world order, as you heard in my recent video. And it's going to happen very, very soon. Now, it's at this moment when this one is in control and when he's calling himself God and all the world is worshiping him that Christ comes. And can you believe it or not? He tries to prevent Christ from setting up his kingdom. What? Revelation 19, verse 11, Christ comes on that white horse and the armies in heaven followed him, verse 14. He comes as the king of the kings and lord of lords, verse 16, to rule for 1,000 years, chapter 20, verse 4. But as he's coming as the king and he's going to come to put down those who are destroying the earth and destroying one another, Revelation 11, verse 18, he comes as the king of the kings and lord of lords, verse 16, to rule for 1,000 years, chapter 20, verse 4. But as he's coming as the king, and he's going to come to put down those who are destroying the earth and destroying one another. Revelation 11, verse 18, something happens. The beast is the Antichrist. And Revelation 19, 19 says, I saw the beast, the Antichrist, the leader of the new world order, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, Jesus, that sat on the white horse. That war is described in Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. And I'm going to tell you something. He's not going to win because when you get to the end of Revelation 19, verse 20, this beast, the leader of the world order, and the false prophet who's promoted even the worship of him are both cast into the bottomless pit. And that's why 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says that Christ destroys the leader of the new world order with the brightness of his coming. Where is that again? 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Mm. What a day. Oh, yes, what a day. Jack, I've heard Jack speak about World War III, haven't you? You know, and that is with the Battle of Armageddon and all the rest. Is the old devil, Lucifer, is he behind World War III also? Yeah. In fact, what I just described is a portion of World War III, the ending of it, when he even says, Lord Jesus, you're not going to put a stop to this. You're not going to take me out of my position. I am now being worshipped as God, and I'm not going to let you take over. And as I said, he loses. But there's something interesting, Rexel, about these fallen angels. And you know, I thought, could this be right? That the angels actually had sex. A very depraved group of angels who suffered serious consequences, punished far greater than those are, who are still roaming around in space. And in Genesis 6, 1, it says, It came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The Bible says every imagination of the thoughts of the mind and heart were only evil continually. Verse 11, the whole world was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. And the world was filled with violence. Why? Because the sons of God, and that's what angels were called in the book of Job, were not just human beings from the line of Cain having relationships with the women of Canaan and producing a mongrel race. No. These were superhuman beings who took on themselves the form of bodies in the likeness of men, like they did in Genesis chapter 19. Read it when they were visiting Abraham. Now, doesn't it say that in heaven they're not going to marry? They're like the angels? Yeah, but that doesn't mean they can't have sexual experiences. 
but it's not necessary in heaven because angels are deathless. They never die. They live forever and ever, and there's no reason for procreation on that side. When we get to heaven and get our new glorified bodies that are just like Jesus, 1 John 3, 2, there'll be no sex in heaven for us because we don't have to procreate to keep the population going. We live forever and forever and forever and forever. Hallelujah is forever. It's going to be a great day. Now, am I the one who originally thought of this? I really searched the commentaries, the Greek and Hebrew lexicons. There was a rabbi named Philo Judaeus who taught this. And then Flavius Josephus, the great historian who lived from 37 to 100, said, this is what's being taught today, that these angels, superhuman beings, created an experience through sex with the women of Canaan, and they bore monstrous humans, giants. Now, I was shocked as I studied this because the kingdom of Og and the kingdom of Bashan had four groups of giants living there. Read it. It's in your Bible. That's One of them was Goliath, against whom David fought with a little slingshot. Why? Because of this monstrous sin that these angels committed. Who were some of these ones, Josephus said, believe this theory about the sex of the angels with the women of Cana. One of them was St. Irenaeus, St. Justin Martyr, St. Tertullian, St. Lactanius and Methodius, church fathers, the leaders of Christendom for the first few hundred years could name others. It's a true theory. And oh, we are going to judge those angels. Now, a special place was reserved for them. You don't believe it? Second Peter 2 Peter 2.4 God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment day. Now the word hell there is a mistranslation. There's only one time this word appears in your entire Bible, and that's in this text, 2 Peter 2.4, and he cast them down to Tartarus place of gloom and doom and darkness and they're bound there as spirits until the great judgment day when they come out and you know who's going to judge them? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, know you not that we the children of God shall judge the fallen angels you don't have to judge the holy angels but there's more in Jude verse 6 the angels which kept not their first estate but left their habitation. Their habitation was in the third heaven with God, but they were cast out. He has reserved in chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. And what was their sin? Let's continue reading it. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, who practiced fornication, was judged because they went after strange flesh. Read Romans chapter 1. A man with a woman is God's way. These perverted beings in Genesis 19 even wanted to rape the angels who appeared in men's bodies. And Lot said, no, don't do so in much evil. I'll tell you, folks, they're coming out one day and sin is going to be judged and not one of us will ever get away with our sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, verse 23. But, three. but the reason that that's so important, Rex Ellie, is there's another group, and I don't know what this has to do with Tartarus, but a group of angels bound in the great river Euphrates where our boys are stationed right now. And when the command comes in this World War III, they hear a voice saying, Revelation 9, verses 14, 18, Loose the four angels bound, bound in the great river Euphrates. Why? To slay a third part of mankind. 
And the number of the army was 200,000 thousand. Perhaps demonic beings, what many Bible teachers believe, filling these troops that come from around the world. Russia, Ezekiel 38 and 39. China, Revelation 16, 12. And chapter 9, verses 14 to 18, for the greatest war in history. And it says, because of these troops and the modern weapons they have called nuclear, one-third of the people die through the fire and brimstone of verse 18. World War III, all by this sinister, vile creature who once was in heaven but wanted to rule everything and go above God. Well, he rules presently, heavens one and two. And when he creates that war, that's the end. For the devil let deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. He's going to go there and join them. And that's the end of Satan forever. Praise the Lord. He was bound for the millennial period for a thousand years, but now it's his decease. We get our new glorified bodies. Believers through the rapture already have them, but now all those left on earth get the glorified bodies. And we live here on terra firma, on earth for the holy city in Revelation 21, comes down and situates itself upon earth. And so they're heard crying, Oh, the tabernacle of God is with them. He's come to earth to live with us forever. That is quite a history lesson, isn't it? A prophetic lesson as to what's coming up. I, I tell you, I've learned an awful lot. You may want to repeat a little bit of that on this tape because it certainly is in-depth from the Bible. Rex, Sally, you're thinking... The truth about angels and demons, we've been talking so much about the demonic forces. And now we're going to go back to the holy angels. You know, the holy angels still exist. Two-thirds of them are still with God. But they're not just in the third heaven. We're going to talk about when they make an appearance also. But uh, let's get back to them, if you will. First of all, I've written down again some very, very good questions about the holy angels. We've been talking about the demonic angels, the holy angels. First of all, are they intelligent? Do they think on their own? Oh, Rexel. In Second Peter chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, the Old Testament prophets couldn't even understand the difference between the suffering of Christ and His glory when He would reign as a king. They said, how can this be? They could not understand the difference between the cross of Christ and the crown He'll wear. And they had a difficult time. But they went on to say in that text, however, the angels desire to look into this situation and study it because they are knowledgeable creatures. All right, friends, as Jack explained, angels have intelligence. Because they have intelligence, can they speak? Can they communicate? They spoke to Mary, we know, and to Joseph and the Apostle Paul. How about it, Jack? Uh, you mentioned Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. He said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Meaningless. Not only that. But Gabriel appears to Mary in Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, and says, Your son shall be great, Mary, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and he shall sit upon the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Israel forever and forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Again, Paul says in Galatians 1, 8, Though we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let him be a curse, an angel preaching. And then I like what Jesus said in Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things, the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, to the churches. Now, there is an angel communicating again. Love it, love it. Something that I always thought about angels, I thought they're always happy, singing, playing a harp, that kind of thing. But can they have other feelings? Do they have sorrow sometimes? Are they always happy? Jack, how about this? Do they have feelings? Oh, they definitely do. And you know, 
The Bible says in Luke 15, verse 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. When they hear about it, there's a hallelujah chorus going throughout the entire heavenlies. And even the loved ones there are told whether some of their children for whom they prayed for years got saved. And sorrow, in Revelation 8, 1, it says there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. Why? Because the angels know that they have to continue administering the 21 judgments that fall upon the earth during the tribulation hour of Revelation chapter 6 to 18. And they know the great whoa, 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 three times is coming. And they are so alarmed and, and feel so sorry for these people who won't repent in Revelation 9.21. Holy angels, are there very many of them? Are there millions of them in God's presence right now? Well, here's something wonderful that Dr. A.C. Gabeline had to say about the vast numbers of angels. Read it with me, will you, friends? It'll bless your heart. Their number is so vast that no man can comprehend the total. Their intelligence is akin to that of God. Their strength and power is so great. Well, they are creatures as deathless as God himself. There are fleets of them, squadrons of them, and millions of them. I love that, don't you, friends? Millions of them. And uh, I like the fact that uh, they're not only in heaven, Jack, but they can also be here. Millions of them. Can you tell us where that's found in the Bible, please? Well, first of all, it says in Hebrews 12, 22, that the angels amount to an innumerable host. They cannot be numbered, there are so many. But I like what I see in Revelation 5, verse 11. In verses 9 and 10, we have the redeemed who are raptured, singing about the Lamb of God. And now the angels join in, and it says 10,000 times 10, thousands and thousands and thousands are singing, worthy is the Lamb. Oh, can you imagine what that heavenly choir sounds like? Praising Jesus for dying on the cross. And I, I want to say, folks, it, it'll be a great day when we're there. Now, remember this. When Jesus comes, he returns with ten thousands of his saints. Jude, verse 14. Why? Because they had no way of saying millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, so they just said tens of thousands. So when he talks about that heavenly choir, 100 million strong plus thousands and thousands, he means innumerable growth, probably into the billions. All right, millions. Where in the world would millions of angels live? Do they all just stay right there in the third heaven? Is that their home forever? Where do the millions of angels live, Jack? The angels. Do they all just stay right there in the third heaven? Is that their home forever? Where do the millions of angels live, Jack? The angels live in heaven, Matthew 22, 30. Very simple. And as I've shown earlier, that is the third heaven where God reigns with his holy angels, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. All right, now we have three wonderful attributes of God three attributes. The first one is omniscience, knowing everything about everything. Jack, do the angels have the omniscience that God has? Only God does. And Acts 15 verse 18 says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of creation. That takes in the gap theory as well. And then 1 Timothy 1 17 says that he is the only wise God. Now, angels are not. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, as I said earlier, they wanted to study this thing that the Old Testament prophets couldn't quite analyze the difference between the cross and the crown when he reigns as the king. All right, Jack, we're going to go on to the second attribute of God, and that is omnipotent, all-powerful. Not only does God know everything, but he's all-powerful. Are the angels all-powerful? Absolutely not, honey. Only God is all of these things. And Psalm 19, verses 1 to 3 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. But when one gazes into the vast creation that God's put up there, Think of it. The astronomers now tell us 100 billion galaxies like ours, each with 200 million to 400 million suns. 
but you see it and you understand it, you understand Romans 1.20, the heavens show his omnipotence, his power. And that third wonderful attribute of God, omnipresence. I'm so glad God is with me. He's everywhere at all times. Jack, are the angels everywhere? Listen to the psalmist, what he says in chapter 139, verses 7 to 11. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from the, your presence, God? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there does your hand lead me and your right hand does embrace me because he's everywhere at all times. He cannot be taken from any place in the world because he is God. Now, the angels are not that way, especially the fallen angels. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, other humans, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirit wickedness in high places. The reason there are millions, a third of the angels that fell are into the millions, cannot know everything. Therefore, even Satan, who's their leader, can't. He has an army just like we have forced our generals all the way down to buck privates. And so these fallen angels have different degrees of knowledge as they travel throughout the whole world and work in the minds of people and then report back to the commander-in-chief, Satan. So that's the only way he can find out what's going on through all of his millions of angels communicating the message of what they've seen on earth and that's not true with God he's the all wise God he knows everything because he's everywhere at all times I would like to go back and forth with Jack here and uh, discover how angels were involved in the life of Jesus when he was here on earth they were involved first of all starting with his conception and the announcement to the Virgin Mary Jack and that's, of course, Luke chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, for thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. In verse 34, she said, How this sh shall this be? I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. I cannot even imagine how that young virgin must have felt, the Virgin Mary. Well, was were the angels involved in his birth? Uh, being a shepherd out in the field and hearing those voices, my, they were involved in his oh, birth, Jack. Oh, Rick, so this is Luke chapter 2, verses 10 to 14. The angel appears and says, Fear not, Mary, for behold, I bring you great tidings of joy, for this day is born unto you in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And then the angels departed. They went back to heaven. Satan tried to tempt Jesus on that mount of temptation. He said, Fall down and worship me and I'll give you the world. Well, what did the angels do then? They could have come and they could have defended Jesus. What did the angels do at the Mount of Temptation, Jack? Temptation, Jack. Well, at that point, he must have been very weary because he had been up in that mount fasting for 40 days. And he'd gone through three temptations that were offered to him by old Slewfoot, Lucifer, Satan, the old dragon of Revelation 20, verse 2. So he must have been very weary. But I like what it says in Matthew 4.11. The angels came and ministered unto Jesus. And of course, they knew him from all eternity before he came to die for sinners. Jack and I have been in the Garden of Gethsemane many times. I always want to weep when I go there because that's where the soldiers took Jesus. And then, of course, they took him to be crucified. What did the angels do when Jesus was in that garden? What did they do when the, when the soldiers took Jesus to crucify him, Jack? Rexella, there's so many hypocrites within 
the Christian faith today. They're in all of our churches. But Judas was the greatest hypocrite in history. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they all thought maybe they were responsible. And Jesus said, the one that dips from the dish, he it is. And Judas dipped it. Apparently, they didn't see it. But he goes to the commanders of the Roman legions and says, I know where he prays. And I'll take you there if you pay me 30 pieces of silver. But he said, you know, I don't want the disciples and others to know what I'm up to. So this is what I'll do. I'll go up to him and throw my arms around him and kiss him and say, Oh, Jesus, I love you. I love you. Oh, And the disciples say, Boy, isn't that something? The soldiers are coming. He doesn't care. But what hypocrisy. For that kiss sent to the soldiers, that's the one you take to kill. And Jesus was praying in Gethsemane when that happened. And his heart was so heavy. Because he knew the hour had come for him to die. And this had been the plan from all eternity. All right? So as they come to get him, to hang him on that cross, Peter draws out a sword and he's going to defend Jesus. And he said, put away your sword, Peter. Now get this, Matthew twenty six fifty three. If I needed help, I would presently call on my father and he would send 12 legions of angels. A legion was 6,000. 12 legions, 72,000 angels to stop it. But then he adds, but then how would the scriptures be fulfilled? You see, Jesus always was, as I said earlier, and he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. First Peter one twenty to die for you and me. And Revelation thirteen eight adds, Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Trinity sat down and said, One of us will have to go, for without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Hebrews nine twenty two. Therefore one must take a body to die. Jesus said, I'll go. And now the hour has come. Put away your sword. If I wanted to stop this, 72,000 angels would come. But the scripture then would never have been fulfilled, the plan from all eternity. Oh, my. And probably the greatest experience of my life, and I tell you this honestly from my soul, was going to the area where Jesus was crucified. Jack has just talked about it. And then going over to the garden tomb. Whoa, that brings joy to your heart. I cannot even express with words, knowing that Jesus was there, that he rose again, victorious over death. Jack, the angels were there also, weren't they, at his resurrection? Oh, he was in that tomb three days and three nights, and close to the morning of the resurrection, maybe hours before, an angel appeared and rolled away that humongous stone from the grave so that Christ could vacate it and come out. And that's Matthew 28, verse 2. Well, it's the morning of the resurrection, and they're wondering, was Jesus right when he said, after three days and three nights, I'm going to raise myself from the dead? So they came, and the tomb is empty, and an angel is sitting there. And he says in Mark chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, don't be frightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Come, see the place where they laid him. He's gone. And you know, you must believe in that resurrection if you ever want to get to heaven. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9. I believe it. You better believe it. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. He said, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news, that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy 2, 8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. And listen to Jesus himself in Revelation 1, 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And then he cries out, Amen. And Amen. Rexella, two years ago, on our telecast, to all the world, you sang 
about that moment when you stood there at the empty tomb. And oh, people were so moved, and I was so moved, I began weeping. And people wrote and said, Dr. Van Impe, we've never seen you weep for anything. And that moved our hearts. And I want you to get the blessing of that moment before we go on with the remainder of the study in this video. Rexella, sing it sweet. Excellent. That was beautiful. I just thank the Lord for you and the great ministry you have, not only as my anchor woman on television, but in so many other areas of life and your piano playing, your singing, and how you've blessed multitudes across America in over 1,000 crusades we had with 10 million people attending. And I remember when you did this song in Israel, standing by the tomb of Jesus, what they're seeing right now on the screen is actually the place where Jesus rose from the dead. And that moved my heart, but I'll never forget the day you used it on television for Easter. And I actually got so moved, I broke down and I started crying. I couldn't control myself because I thought of what Jesus had done as he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day victorious over death. And because your sweet voice and your personality 
move my heart also. Thank you, honey. Thank you, Jack. Oh, my. Thank you. Well, Dr. Gabeline also addresses something very, very important, and that's Jesus' ascension into heaven. What a day it must have been in glory when the Son of God clothed in the real human body. Of course, that was his glorified body. Returned to heaven, his eternal dwelling place. Angels accompanied him in his glorious upsweep, clothed in the Shekinah cloud. He passed through the heavens, all laws of nature, which he made and maintains in his creation, were set aside. He passed through the first heaven, passing the planets of our solar system. Then he passed the distant constellations with its millions of suns till the limit of the second heaven were reached. And then in the portal which leads into the third heaven, the heaven of heaven, which no human eye has ever seen, he advanced to enter in, surrounded by the worshiping hosts of angels. Oh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Gabriel. That was too. wonderful. Wow. Jack, the angels were there at his ascension. Yeah. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come back in like manner as you have seen him go. So what he's saying is these two in white were angels and they saw him ascend, maybe went up with him, but the angels are going to come back with him as well as we're going to see in a few minutes. The rapture, the rapture, the two are. Now, if you watch our program, you know Jack speaks about two R's. The rapture, when Jesus says come up, the revelation when Jesus comes down to earth. All right, the rapture. Uh, now, let's talk about that. Will the angels be present at the rapture when Jesus comes and says to the saints on earth, come up, come up in the rapture, Jack? 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16, 18, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Here it is with the shout of the archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And Rexella, I have something I believe with all my heart. The Bible teaches that when Lazarus died in Luke 16, 22, the angels came and transported him to heaven. I personally believe that of these millions upon millions of angels, every one of us has a personal angel, a guardian angel, as many say, a ministering angel. For all of us, for Hebrews 1.14 says, are not the angels ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them? Watch the language now who shall be the heirs of salvation. We already have salvation when we receive Christ here on earth. But this is a shall be thing. And that's when he says, come up hither, Revelation 4.1, and we sweep through 187 trillion billions of miles in 11 one hundredths of a second, the twinkling of an eye. And I believe every last one of us will have our own personal angel there with us, transporting us, through glory, to see Jesus face to face. Now, that's also discussed in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Paul says, I show you a mystery. A mystery is something that's never been mentioned before in the Scripture until that point. What is that mystery? And there's something that's never been mentioned before in the Scripture until that point. What is that mystery? And then as we enter the portals of heaven, so wonderfully described by Dr. Gabeline, we are changed to be like Jesus. The psalmist said in chapter 17, verse 15, I shall be satisfied when I awaken with thy likeness. Philippians 3.21 says that he's going to change our decrepit bodies that they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Praise God, my arthritis will be cured then, Rexella. <laughs> and 1 John 3, yeah. 2 says, when we see Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Then we're on that side until the marriage of the Lamb takes place in Revelation 19, 7. That's the bride of Christ, we believers who were raptured, becoming married to the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that takes place while there's seven years of tribulation on this earth, discovered in Revelation chapter 6 to 18, where 21 judgments fall, many of them brought to pass by angels, the good angels, now allowing judgment to fall on the earth because humanity is depraved in every kind of sin. Romans 9, 21. God's calling on them to repent, turn from your sins. But Revelation 9, 21 says they would not repent of their murders, their fornication, sexual abuses, their pharmacias, drug abuses, and their thefts. So the judgment has to come administered by holy angels. Then the angels return with us when we come with Jesus as the honeymoon takes place on earth and he sets up his kingdom for 1,000 years. Revelation 20, verse 4. Isn't that going to be a thrilling moment? Oh, there's the holy city descending with Jesus in us. And it hangs in space for the first thousand years and then comes down and situates itself upon earth so that we'll be able to cry out in that day, Oh, isn't this glorious? The tabernacle of God has come to be here with us on earth. And that, of course, is found in Revelation 21, chapter 21 verse 9 to 22, 15 is that first appearing of the holy city for the thousand years as it hangs in space. And then chapter 21 verses 1 to 8 is when it comes here to earth. And oh, I love verse 4. This is when we're here again with him. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying. For the former things are passed away. It's going to be nothing but joy unspeakable and full of glory. But after the thousand years, he's recommissioned. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. And what was only a kingdom for a thousand years now becomes the eternal kingdom here on terra firma, here with Christ forever and forever. That's why Revelation 11, verse 15 says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. And we reign with him for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4. But after he's recommissioned, we reign with him forever and forever and forever, Revelation 22, 5. And you know, I like what I just read by the astronomers mentioned earlier. They say the world will not end for another 100 trillion years. Well, sleep well. I got even better news. The world is never going to end, for it's a world without end, Isaiah 45, 17, and Ephesians 3:21. But you know, I want to just pause here for a minute now. Oh, this is moving. The Word of God teaches, as I said, each one of us has a ministering angel who takes care of us here in this life and then who will transport us to glory as we go home to meet Jesus and sweep through those portals of the third heaven. But I've got a beautiful story to tell here. And I just want to give this first before my wife tells it of her out-of-body experience. Oh, I don't believe in that stuff. Then you don't believe the Bible. In Acts 14, 19, the Apostle Paul was stoned and taken to Lystra and thrown in the rubbish pile for dead. Acts 14, 19 was written in 46 A.D. In 60 A.D., 14 years later, it describes Paul's experience, and he's telling it. But he tells it in the form of another person so that no one will think he's a braggart. Listen to him. I knew a man in Christ above a little over 14 years ago. You sure did, Paul. Acts 14 to 2 Corinthians 12 is 14 years. He says, whether he was in the body, I cannot tell. Whether he was out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up to the third heaven and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And I knew such a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. How that he was caught up into paradise. And oh, what he saw. Paul said it was such a wonderful experience of what he saw, actually saw in the third heaven, 
that he could say in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. If Paul could have that experience, others could. They have to be genuine. I experienced the genuine thing in Brussels, Belgium, with my sweetheart, Rexella. Tell us about it, honey. Mm. I'm very, very humbled by having this opportunity to share with you what happened to us when we were in Belgium. It was a bright, beautiful, sunny day. We were there in Brussels with Jack's relatives celebrating our anniversary. I'll never forget, Jack took me to lunch. We had such a great time. And we were going back to celebrate with the relatives that evening just outside of Brussels in a little city there. And they were giving us a great reception for our anniversary. Well, just as we were exiting the Brussels, here came a huge bus. And Jack pulled out. It was not his fault at all. But this bus came along and took the right side of that little tiny foreign car right off. And I was on that side. So, of course, I went flying out. I'll never forget seeing that bus come toward us. And I said, oh, no. Oh, no. Well, there I was out on the street. Uh, friends, uh, it's very difficult for me to put into words what I'm going to share with you right now, but Psalm 9111 does come to focus in my mind. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. So there I am, lying in the street of Belgium, but I really wasn't there because my spirit was leaving my body. And I will never, never forget, I thought... As I, as my spirit was leaving my body, I looked back and I thought, oh, I hate to leave you, Jack, because he was praying over my body. And I said, if this is dying, oh, what peace. I never had such peace. I really wanted to go on to be with my Lord, my Savior. But just that quickly as I look back, it was almost as if God said, not time yet. And I was back in my body just that fast. I had not reached the third heaven. I did not see what the Apostle Paul saw. I have not seen nor ear heard, but I was out of my body. Well, I believe the reason that Satan tried to do evil that day was because eight weeks later, Jack and I were going on national television. We were going to begin our weekly program. And Satan knew that. We'd been talking about it. He can't read our minds, but he knows what we say. He knew that Jack Van Impey had contracted all these television stations across America. So Satan didn't want me involved. And so he was going to take my life. He meant it for evil. And this experience, God meant for good. So I, so I was back in my body. And I will never forget as I lay there, woo all of a sudden, it was no more peace, it was pain, pain in my body. And I heard Jack's voice. My face was filled with, with blood, and I tried to uh, scrape away the blood from my eyes. And as I did, I not only heard Jack praying, but I saw my guardian angel. And he said very quietly, perfect English, downtown Brussels, she's going to be all right. And he took a blanket. Now, here we are in August, summer. He took a blanket and put it over me. I believe that my angel came for two reasons. One, to protect me, and the other, to comfort us, to let Jack know and me know that I was going to be all right. He was gone. He was gone. The ambulance came, took us to the hospital, and there I was in a hospital in Brussels. And I said, where is my blanket? The blanket was gone. God had already had his guardian angel do those things, protect me, comfort me, and no more reason for his guardian angel to be by my side. But there was another experience accompanying this. Dr. Carl Baugh, who is on our American board, 
is one of the greatest archaeologists in the world today. He's been around the world in all kinds of diggings, and especially in the Holy Land. And he has a wonderful museum. And one day, not too long ago, just a few years ago, he came to our headquarters and he said, I have uh, asked a great artist in Dallas, Texas, if he would bring to the museum a great piece of art. And I asked him if he would please give us a Moses writing the Ten Commandments with an angel looking over his shoulder. He brought it one for us too. Not only did he have one in his museum there in Texas, but he also brought one to our headquarters here. And um, when he brought it in, we were in the boardroom and he said, I have a surprise for you. And he presented it to Jack and to me. And whoa, oh, I can hardly say this to you, friends. Tears began to roll down my face as I saw my guardian angel, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. It was something that the artist had known from the Lord, and it was the image of a man who spoke to us in Belgium, my guardian angel, the guardian angel overlooking Moses' shoulder. Thank you, God. I want to add, Rexella, to that story. This bus not only took the side off, but it came over the top of the car and mashed it down. Had we been wearing seat belts, and I believe in wearing them, but we would have been dead then because the roof would have crushed our heads. Mm -hmm. And you flew out, and as I went down on the seat, I was gripping the wheel, and I was in a daze for a few minutes. And I crawled out of that car, and I saw the blood all over you. And I took you in my arms, and I started crying. I said, oh, please, God. I need Rexella. I need her. Don't let her pass away. Please, God, help us. Please, God, help us. And as the tears rolled down my face, they fell on yours, and that's when you opened your eyes. And I saw that man standing there. And you know, men are often the ones who appear as those angels. Yes. The angel world is male. Read Genesis 19. And I'll tell you, I believe more than ever in some of these out-of-body experiences. Yes. Hebrews 13, 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Right. There's a lot to it. I just want to add this <clears throat> a little thought here, too. Uh, I'm not special. You have a guardian angel. He's watching over you. And one day, when we go into heaven, what peace, what joy, what happiness. Don't be afraid of death. Death is a joyful, wonder, wonderful transition into our eternal home. Don't be afraid if you have Jesus in your heart. And again, I say thank you, Heavenly Father, for your wonderful care for your children. I believe that angels take us into the presence of the Father and in the presence of Jesus at death, Luke 16, 22, and at the return of Christ. The question is, if you were to die today or if Jesus were to call the rapture, would an angel come to get you or would you be left behind? Now, here's how you get ready. It's not hard. The thief on the cross had done nothing good. He'd been a thief. And he looked at Jesus on the middle cross, and he saw the blood flowing. He saw the agony and suffering in Jesus' face, and he said this, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Nine words. It's that simple. Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You've prayed the right prayer. Will you do it right now? Lord Jesus, remember me. Lord Jesus, you died a horrendous death on the cross. 
from me? Lord Jesus, you love me. And your word says in 1 John 3, 16, that God died on the cross. And it was for me. Thank you, Jesus. God in the flesh. Now, I'm asking you today to be my Savior. I lay all my sin on you, every one of them. For you are a loving, gracious, forgiving Lord. Come into my heart today. Be my Savior. I pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, you know that every week I say on our program, if you prayed that prayer, write to me. I'd love to send you a little book of First Steps in a New Direction. Please write and let me know if you opened your heart to the Lord. Or if you know somebody who needs this, write let me know. I'll be happy to send it. First Steps in a New Direction. Are you ready for that wonderful coming of the Lord? Are you ready for any event in your life that means you will face the Lord, either at the judgment seat or at the great white throne? I trust that you prayed that prayer. And if you did, I just love this little thought. I'm going to give you an extra thought here. You know, when you have the Lord in your life and your enemy, Satan, comes and reminds you of your past, you know what I like to do? I like to remind him of his future. <laughs> it's not going to be in heaven. It's wonderful to know that we're leaving all of this behind, that when we're with the Lord, Satan is not there, and all those who assist him, those fallen angels, are not there. We are with the Lord eternally in our wonderful, wonderful home. I didn't go there in Brussels, but one day I'm going. And if the Lord comes in the rapture, I'm going that way. If it's in another accident, I'll go by that way. And I just want to leave you with this wonderful, wonderful thought. Jack's given us a lot of the Bible today. So much to think about and rely on the Bible. Only rely on what God says. If somebody contradicts the Bible, don't accept it. But if it correlates with the Bible, open your heart and accept it. God's Word is a life preserver that keeps the soul from sinking in a sea of troubles. Amen. Oh, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. And until then, we'll look forward to coming into your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you. So do we so very much. Bye-bye.